Christmas morning 2009, and thousands of people boarded planes all over the world in the last minute dash to make it home. But one man's journey had a very different motive. A 23-year-old suicide bomber, trained by Al-Qaeda, planned to destroy a busy passenger jet bound for the US. Terrorists come back to aviation over and over again because it is such a dramatic target. The plot was painstakingly devised to circumvent our aviation security systems. These are guys who are extraordinarily inventive in the ways they attack the system. Technology is developed over decades to defend us from terrorist attack. I don't know of one case where any form of technology caught a terrorist with a bomb. The terrorists have so many options. We, we can't protect against everything. The plot would also expose fatal flaws in Western intelligence systems. The American intelligence system had enough to know that Umar Farouk Abdul-Matalib should not be allowed to get on the plane. This is the story of how Al-Qaeda smuggled a bomb on board Flight 253. And all of a sudden I heard a pop. And then the flight attendant, she just tore down the aisle at full speed. And discovers what the surprising outcome would have been had the Christmas Day bomb plot gone to plan. Christmas Eve, 2009. In Accra Airport, Ghana, a young man called Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalab began a 23-hour voyage from Africa to the US. The first leg of his journey was Virgin Nigeria Flight 804 to Lagos. Abdul Muttalab begins what is going to be a long journey uh, to the United States in Accra, Ghana. He's going to fly just a few hundred miles along the coast of Western Africa to Nigeria on what is essentially a, you know, a short hop of a flight. He was an ordinary looking guy, very student looking, very relaxed, very chilled, very clever, very intelligent, knew his way about the aviation system, didn't necessarily uh, generate any concern to anybody. Abdul Muttalib's appearance may have been just a kid traveling alone on his way to the United States, perhaps to visit friends or family. He was part of a, of a quite sophisticated plot. In a very real sense, Abdul Muttalib didn't fit the stereotype of what I guess many of us assume uh, a terrorist is. The Western educated son of a wealthy Nigerian banker was used to international travel, but today's journey would be different. Abdul Muttalib was on a mission to get through airport security in three different countries and board a plane with a bomb in his underwear. Unknown to everyone else, sewn into his underpants is a military-grade explosive um, that is known to be a threat to aviation. Abdul Muttalib's 7,000-mile journey will take him via Lagos to Schiphol in the Netherlands. There he plans to board a flight to Detroit. As the plane prepares to land in America, he will explode his device. Abdul Muttalib's bomb plot would be just the latest in a long line of terrorist attacks on passenger airliners, attacks that seem to have evaded every new attempt to tighten security. There's a constant battle going on between terrorist organizations on the one side and um, the aviation industry on the other side. As things have evolved over time, the terrorists are looking at how we do things and they're finding vulnerabilities. And the game is continually changing. And the problem is they have multiple ways of achieving their goal. The Christmas Day attack would once again push the boundaries in the cat and mouse game between terrorists and the constantly evolving security systems they seek to evade. Al-Qaeda has the unique advantage of being an enemy on the offensive, being very crafty and innovative, but also being able to understand almost instantaneously via the internet and the press what 
its enemy, the United States, the UK, and others, are doing to stop it. Abdul Muttalib's plot was devised to exploit one of the last remaining loopholes in aviation security. Just after 8 p.m. on Christmas Eve, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib touched down in Nigeria, completing the first leg of his journey. He had smuggled his bomb through one airport security check and onto a plane undetected. He was now 22 hours away from his goal, detonating his bomb inside a US plane packed with passengers. At Lagos Airport, one of Africa's biggest, Abdul Muttalib faced a well-established series of aviation security checks before he could board his flight to Schiphol. Like all international airports, Lagos follows a strict airport security protocol known as ICAO Annex 17. It sets down basic security procedures developed over decades to prevent terrorist attack. The bombing of Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie in 1988 forced perhaps the biggest rethink of aviation security since the 70s. Sabotage is the most likely cause of the Scottish air disaster. All 258 people on board a Pan American jumbo jet died when the plane exploded and crashed to the ground. Recreations of the blast revealed that it was caused by 400 grams of Semtex. The explosive was hidden inside a radio checked into the hold by a passenger who didn't board the plane. The attack led to rules requiring hold baggage to be screened to deter terrorists. When you check your suitcase to fly, that bag is sent through explosives detection systems, computed tomography, it's like a CAT scan at the hospital. The chance of that technology finding what it's looking for, basically automatically, is nearly 100%. Lockerbie also meant that planes couldn't take off until all passengers who had checked baggage into the hold had boarded. As a result, terrorists were forced to change their tactics. They had to become suicide bombers, carrying their bombs on board planes hidden in hand luggage or on their bodies. They would still encounter security technology, but of a type introduced to counter a threat from an earlier era. We had a spate of hijackings, often involving uh, knives, handguns, incendiary devices, grenades being taken on board planes, planes being hijacked and oftentimes taken out into the desert and held for ransom. Due to the hijackings, the Take Me to Cuba era of the late 60s and early 70s, the decision was made to screen all passengers boarding aircraft. The technology then is not too unsimilar to the technology now at a screening checkpoint. We have metal detection to identify whether we're carrying any weapons on the person. We have x-ray machines to put your bag through to make sure there's no explosive device. We have trace detection systems. People's bags are swabbed to see if there are any trace elements of uh, explosive. When a passenger enters a metal detector arch, it sends pulses through the body, creating a magnetic field that reflects back a signal. If the pulse meets anything metal, like a knife, or the wires and components of a bomb, an opposing magnetic field is created, which triggers an alarm. But metal detectors cannot detect explosives hidden on the body. X-ray scanning machines allow operators to see inside carry-on bags to look for the outlines of weapons and possible explosive devices. At Lagos Airport, CCTV captured this image of Abdul Muttalib calmly reading a newspaper as he waited to go through security screening. He was told to put his shoes through the X-ray scanner. 
The measure was introduced eight years earlier, after shoe bomber Richard Reed smuggled explosives onto a plane hidden in his trainers. But Abdul Muttalab had his explosives hidden elsewhere. He passed through the metal detector without his bomb setting off the alarm. The single biggest concern that aviation security officials have is um, explosives that are non-metallic, that are carried in private parts of, of, a, of a passenger's body. They have determined that we don't have anything in place to find explosives hidden on the person. His carry-on bag also passed through the X-ray machine without incident. Al-Qaeda know the capability of the technology that's deployed in airports worldwide. An X-ray device uh, will look for an improvised explosive device or the telltale signs of that device. Since the package of explosive was hidden in Abdul Muttalib's groin, a standard physical pat-down would almost certainly not have been intrusive enough to discover it. His device had been meticulously designed to evade airport security. In fact, it was a kit of component parts he wouldn't even assemble until he's on board Flight 253. The main charge was the high-explosive pentaerythritol tetranitrate, or PETN, a compound widely used in demolition. PETN is readily available. It can be used in powder form in small amounts to have great effect. Uh, it's been used by terrorists over the years, so it's not a new compound or a new uh, concoction. The terrorists knew that if Abdul Muttalib handled the bomb, he could be caught by electronic trace detectors that sniff out explosive residue. So it's likely someone else created the device. The package, once tightly packed, would be no bigger than a mobile phone, and its plastic wrapping would deter detection. If you take the explosives and you case them in, in something that's not porous, in other words, it doesn't let off vapor or particles, and then you take that item, that sealed package, and you cleanse it, um, then nobody can find it with any technology. Instead of a conventional detonator that could be detected by metal detector or X-ray machines, he had a small amount of liquid chemical to ignite the PETN. Finally, he had a syringe to administer the chemical that he could claim he carried for medical reasons. This was the perfect device, simply made out of components that couldn't be seen by the conventional technology uh, that we have in airports nowadays. They've developed a device here uh, that can essentially sail through all of that security process entirely undetected. The idea of smuggling Abdul Muttalib's explosive through security checks in his underwear had already been road tested by Al Qaeda. Four months before the Christmas Day attack, a suicide bomber had blown himself up in a failed attempt to assassinate a Saudi government minister. It was discovered that he, too, had passed through a metal detector with PETN hidden in his underpants. The attempted assassination of Mohammed bin Nayef, the counterterrorism chief for Saudi Arabia, was an incredibly important moment. This was a canary in the coal mine because it suggested that uh, al-Qaeda in Yemen was growing more sophisticated with its explosives, that they have a, a bomb maker that's uh, expert in this. And it also suggested that this was a new way that they were trying to hide the explosive. Western intelligence issued no official warning to alert aviation security officials to al-Qaeda's new deadly tactic. Standard airport security technology had so far failed to stop Abdul Muttalib. But he still faced a second system of safeguards, security documentation designed to ensure only genuine passengers can board planes. At 8.35 p.m., Abdul Muttalib presented his passport. It held a U.S. visa granted 18 months earlier when he'd been at college in London. He cannot board a U.S. flight without it. If he had subsequently come under suspicion, the U.S. authorities might have revoked it, stopping his mission in its tracks. 
Abdul Muttalib's visa was still valid, and he was allowed to continue his journey. There was nothing in Abdul Muttalib's prestigious Nigerian background to suggest he might be a suicide bomber in the making. The young man's journey towards jihad appears to have begun four years earlier while he was studying engineering in London. He was the head of an Islamic society at his university. At the same time as Abdul Muttalib was getting more and more deeper into his studies of Islam, he also was expressing on internet sites how lonely he was and how isolated he felt. It's the kind of uh, recipe for someone who could get caught up in the kind of extremist views. Abdul Muntalab seems to have been the perfect operative. Here was a clean skin, somebody who wasn't known to the intelligence community. They're looking for people who may not look like the typical uh, operatives that Al-Qaeda has relied on in the past uh, and who can operate pretty easily in Western societies. In 2008, he left London to continue his studies in Dubai. Then he abandoned the course and traveled across the Middle East. His destination was Yemen, one of the poorest countries in the region. It's been plagued by civil war and weak government. By 2009, it had become a crucible for al-Qaeda terrorism. Yemen has always been a, uh, a haven for al-Qaeda. It's the ancestral home for Osama bin Laden. You've really had uh, a witch's brew of problems in Yemen that has allowed al-Qaeda to take deeper root. Matthew Salmon came to Yemen to learn Arabic. He didn't realize that one of his fellow students was an al-Qaeda suicide bomber in the making. My first impression of him was that he was a very um, gentle individual. He was very soft-spoken, um, but very friendly as well. He never talked about his past. He inferred that when he had lived in Western societies, he was uncomfortable. One day in September 2009, Abdul Muttalib simply disappeared. I had noticed that he had left. He had left without saying goodbye to any of the students. Um, and we all found it strange that he had left without saying goodbye to us or telling us where he was going. While in Yemen, it's believed that Abdul Muttalib came into contact with notorious extremist cleric Anwar al-Alaki. The reach of Anwar al-Alaki is vast, uh, and he is like the siren song for many Westerners seeking a radicalized path uh, within Islam. One of al-Alaki's disciples was U.S. Army psychiatrist Major Malik Hassan, who shot dead 13 people at Fort Hood military base in Texas. Hassan had exchanged 18 emails with Al-Alaki, who also had links to the 9-11 bombers. Al-Alaki has denied any role in Abdul Muttalib's Christmas Day attack. Abdul Muttalib had dropped off the radar, but nobody suspected that he had joined the ranks of Al-Qaeda. Except for one man, his father. In November uh, 2009, Abdul Muttalib's father uh, entered the U.S. Embassy in Abuja. He was concerned about his son, that his son was growing more and more radical, and that he was falling in with uh, the wrong crowd and had traveled to Yemen. His dad is, a, is the, the chairman of a very big bank in Nigeria, and so this is not like just some nobody coming in from the street. He's someone that the officials there respect and uh, take a warning quite seriously. The embassy sent a warning, called a Visa Viper, to the National Counterterrorism Center in McLean, Virginia. Analysts there established Abdul Muttalib had a visa, allowing him to travel to the US. But it was decided that his father's concerns were not enough to revoke it. That kind of report comes in, you know, dozens of times a day, maybe even hundreds of times a day, from different places across the world. 
It was a single thread. It was alone in isolation. It was enough to essentially do almost nothing other than to put it into the system. Experts believe the intelligence should have prompted further investigation. The father was a prominent individual in Nigeria, and he used some important words like radicalization, Yemen, things that should have triggered uh, further scrutiny, but it wasn't highlighted. There wasn't diligence done. Nobody took ownership of that single fact and started asking those pertinent questions of the other agencies within US government. Adu Mutalib arrives in Schiphol uh, just around dawn. It's 5.37 a.m. Now it's Christmas Day. After a journey of 11 hours, Abdul Mutalib is now within sight of his final objective. To get on board Flight 253 to Detroit and take down the plane and everybody on board. But Amsterdam's Schiphol airport is where Abdul Mutalib's murderous plan is most likely to fall apart. It is one of the world's biggest and busiest hubs, handling on average 1,100 flights a day. Aldu Mutalib, as he makes his journey from Africa and Ghana to Nigeria to Amsterdam on his way to the United States, is passing into bigger and bigger airports. And, and in fact, he's passing into uh, more sophisticated uh, security systems. In Amsterdam in particular, the security system is considered very strong. They take it very seriously. They spend the money to do it right. Uh, they've been pioneers in a number of areas of security. They come as close to doing it as right as anybody I know. And it's not just enhanced security he faces. Because Abdul Mutalib is flying to Detroit, his journey would face live online interaction with the US authorities for the first time. Post 9-11, all flights to the US have been treated as prime terrorist targets. I wouldn't say I was completely relaxed. I was just maybe a little bit nervous. I, I'm often a bit nervous on an American airliner flying to America. I was really surprised. I thought in flying on Christmas Day, I thought it would be rather quiet, but it was very crowded. Passengers for Northwest Flight 253 start queuing for security, unaware that one of their fellow passengers is a committed terrorist. I was traveling from Mumbai and I'm visiting India with my family. I was very excited. After five weeks, everybody likes to come home, and it was Christmas Day. I was very excited to meet my family members. Adu Mutalib is required by international accord to go through security yet again. The U.S. demands that all passengers flying to the States face extra questioning by security personnel employed by the Dutch authorities. It's a professional one-on-one -on -one grilling designed to blow a terrorist cover story. He's, he's already traveled for 11 hours. He's probably tired. He's also probably increasingly nervous. You know, he's basically a novice at this. This is the last line of defense. This is the place where you absolutely have to stop the guy who has intent. If there's going to be a time that he's going to stumble, this is probably the moment. While they're asking the questions, uh, they are, are looking for reactions from the person. He's facing questions about, you know, where is he going and what is he doing? Might be a question as to why he was carrying no coat with him when he's going to a cold destination, why he's got so limited baggage on him. It's not going down that checklist and just ticking boxes, but actually digging a little bit deeper if the, the, there's even the slightest suspicion uh, that somebody may not be as clean as would appear. Al-Qaeda intensively train their operatives in preparation for this, the toughest moment of their mission. They looked at his passport, they asked him questions, they looked at his visas, they looked him in the eye, which they're trained to do, and he was able to convince those people that, that he was not a threat. Abdul Mutalab passed his biggest test. But, according to a fellow passenger, after more than an hour spent on the ground at Schiphol, he was struggling to maintain his composure. I was looking around, there's a strange guy standing. His right hand was on his uh, forehead. 
and he was like looking nervous so i was uh, i was thinking something strange or weird looking this guy i wanted to say to somebody but then i said uh, it's this is not my job this is security job so i let it go as the passengers check in for northwest airlines flight 253 information that abdul mutalib was about to board an american plane was winging its way around the globe to us officials After check-in and up to 30 minutes before the plane departs, airlines flying to the states must submit details of all passengers to the national targeting center. One of the NTC's jobs is to check passenger names against watch lists of individuals who might pose a direct threat to the US. A month earlier, his father had warned the CIA that his son might be mixing with Islamic extremists. Although it wasn't considered enough to revoke Abdul Mutalib's US visa, his name was added to a counterterrorism database of people thought to pose a low-level threat. Abdul Mutalib's name because of what his father had reported appeared on the broad terrorist identities data mart environment, the Tide database. That's almost 600,000 individuals at this point. That's the grand radar screen of suspect individuals. It's a hodgepodge of people. It could be something as simple as you once before had crossed the border into the United States from Mexico and were carrying some food that was prohibited, and, and therefore you are put into Tide. The National Targeting Center don't routinely check the Tide list before boarding. For them to stop Abdul Mutalib getting on flight 253, he would have to be on the toughest list of all, the no-fly list. The no-fly list, the most selective of these lists that are public, um, is a list of about 4,000 individuals. We have enough information about these individuals to suggest that they are a direct danger to the aircraft. The no-fly list is just what it says on the tin. Um, it's a, a, a list of individuals who are not allowed to fly for whatever the reason that might be, and primarily that reason is their connection with terrorism. Abdul Mutalib was on a, a list for the U.S. government, but it wasn't the no-fly list, which would have disallowed his boarding of the flight to the United States. The no-fly list doesn't just protect those traveling to and from the U.S. It is shared with most international airports. The National Targeting Center cleared all 279 passengers to board flight 253. But there had been a serious breakdown in the US intelligence system. Crucial information elsewhere in the system that would have put Abdul Mutalib on the no-fly list had been fatally overlooked. Some non-U.S. intelligence service uh, intercepts a communication among suspected Al Qaeda members in Yemen that says there's a quote Umar Farouk, no last name, um, an Umar Farouk who is in Yemen and perhaps participating in some plot. Separately, there's information that there's a Nigerian in Yemen that's in some way participating in a plot. It's around the same time as the dad has come to the embassy and said, my son, Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalib, has disappeared. He may be in Yemen, and he's, got a, he's gotten caught up with extremist views. There were bits and pieces all throughout uh, the US intelligence community. Uh, we didn't put the pieces together well enough and quickly enough to stop Abdul Mutalib, this kid, from getting on the plane. The failure of the system to join the dots about Abdul Mutalib has implications for all international airline passengers. It's a system that is not serving as well either in the United States uh, or, for that matter, elsewhere in the world because we are talking about a global threat here and we are talking about um, an intelligence community that should be keeping an eye on that global threat as effectively as possible. By 7 a.m. on Christmas Day, there was just one last obstacle standing between Abdul Mutalib and Flight 253 to Detroit. The final pre-gate security check. 
and one single piece of technology that could prove his downfall. Schiphol, along with many Western airports, had started introducing millimeter wave body scanners to their security armory. Millimeter waves are radio waves set to a frequency that allows them to pass through clothing. When they encounter a solid surface like the human body, they bounce back and the reflected waves create a naked image that reveals any object concealed beneath clothing, even non-metallic ones. The technology offers the best chance of detecting a suspicious package concealed on someone's body. They allow the guys manning the security checkpoint to see whether you have anything hidden underneath your clothes, anything strapped to your body that could pose a risk to everybody else that's getting on the flight. By Christmas Day 2009, Schiphol Airport had a number of body scanners on site. But they had been unable to reach final agreement with US authorities on how they should be used. It meant that Abdul Muttalib faced only the standard metal detector and X-ray technology. He cleared both without any incident. Abdul Muttalib had overcome the twin safeguards protecting Flight 253's passengers from terrorist attack. Conventional airport technology had failed to detect the bomb in Abdul Muttalib's underwear. And the world's most sophisticated intelligence system had proven unable to identify Abdul Muttalib as a deadly threat. The 23-year-old suicide bomber was poised to launch a Christmas Day attack that would shock the world. At 8.55 a.m., Northwest Airlines Flight 253 took off from Amsterdam bound for Detroit. There were 290 passengers and crew on board. Among them, the Keepman family, flying home from Ethiopia with two small children they had adopted. I think we all felt different from when we traveled there versus traveling home because we had two new beautiful children that were experiencing flying for the first time. They were experiencing everything new for the first time and it made it that much more important to protect them and make sure that they were safe. Also on board in seat 17G was 20-year-old musician Daniel Husinger. Having been gone for two months, I was looking forward to seeing my family and my friends, just being able to see him face to face, give him a hug, say Merry Christmas. Two rows behind Daniel, another young man was traveling alone. Seated in 19A was 23-year-old Nigerian Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, an Al-Qaeda-trained suicide bomber. He had reached the final phase of his mission to bring down Flight 253 and everyone on board. He takes a seat at 19A. If you're going to blow something up and you want to pierce the exterior of the plane, unfortunately, that's the place you want to be um, because the fuel is contained in the wing and he was in perhaps the best seat for, to carry out the plot that he was undertaking. For over a month, U.S. intelligence agencies had failed to collate information that would have put Abdul Muttalib on the no-fly list. Only now, with the flight airborne, were passenger names checked against further lists of individuals considered a possible threat. Once you've allowed to board the plane, you're headed to the United States, then there's a whole second security apparatus, which is then asking the question, should this person be allowed into the United States? As the plane is essentially flying to the U.S., they're creating a short list of people that they want to question more thoroughly. Officials at Customs and Border Protection in Virginia ran Flight 253's passenger names against the Thai database. The list of nearly 600,000 people of concern to the U.S. And they got a match. That was enough for them to decide, even before the plane had landed, that, that he was going to be subject to questioning, aggressive questioning, at the airport. Abdul Muttalib's presence on the Thai database was enough to have him questioned on arrival in the States, but not enough to turn the plane back.
Most of the flight we played games, read books, practiced the children's English. I think we were just so excited to get home. It was completely business as usual. The drinks, the pretzels, I watched a couple of movies, I took a little nap. We're now flying over the Great Lakes. We should be getting into the Detroit area in about 40 minutes. 40 minutes before landing, he left his seat. He made his way to the lavatory. It was time for him to assemble his bomb, smuggled on board as a kit of parts. No one knows precisely what he did during the 20 minutes he spent inside the cubicle. It's thought he assembled the components of his bomb and primed his chemical detonator. He's probably gone through this routine a number of times, and it's his job. This is his big assignment. This is why he was chosen to execute on the construction of the bomb. And it has to be done on the plane because if it were assembled, and it probably would have been noticed um, as he was getting onto the plane. Experts believe Abdul Muttalab would have filled his syringe with liquid chemical. By plunging this deadly cocktail into the PETN, he hoped to trigger a violent chemical reaction, generating enough heat to trigger the explosion. But the process is difficult to achieve even in a laboratory because the intense heat only lasts milliseconds. With his bomb and detonator primed, Abdul Muttalab now prepared himself for the final act of his mission, to kill himself and everyone on board. 20 minutes till landing, and Northwest 253 began its approach into the Detroit area. On the ground, border and customs officials made their way to the gate to question Abdul Muttalab when he landed. comes back to his seat and tells others apparently sitting next to him that he's not that his stomach is upset and he pulls a blanket over his body. Cabin crew, 20 minutes to landing. 20 minutes to landing. We had uh, begun descent into Detroit and uh, so at that point in the flight most everyone was awake kind of all sitting there expectantly okay we're about to land here we go. I was just sitting there, kind of in a bit of a daze, you know, sort of trying to wake up and maybe lolling off at the same time. At around the time Flight 253 crossed the Canadian border and entered US airspace, Abdul Muttalab started to inject his chemical into the PETN. The very first thing that happened was a loud pop in the cabin. And all of a sudden I heard a pop. It sounded to me like an electrical current that snapped. The sound unnerved the passengers, but nothing out of the ordinary could be seen. Then all of a sudden, I hear the word fire. So I think, oh my, you know, oh my God, this pl I think the plane's on fire. And I opened my seatbelt and I just turned my back and I start looking what is happening. I immediately jumped up and started looking around and I saw there was uh, smoke coming out of that area. There was uh, flashes of light. And then I smell non-natural things burning. That uh, smell hit me and start coughing. In seat 19A, flames are seen climbing the side of the plane's fuselage. I could see all the flame and the fire and the smoke and everything. There was a man sitting in the seat uh, where the fire had started, and my first thought was that he had lit his blanket on fire. And there was a moment then where this woman's voice cut through everything. What are you doing? What's going on? And I could tell from the timber in her voice that there was something 
something was amiss. And that's when I thought, hmm, yeah, this might not go. The reality of the situation began to dawn. I knew at that time that it was, this was a serious event and, and that our lives were at stake. I was sure I was going to die. I said, that's it, that's the end of the, uh, end of my life. The fear is beyond imagination. And I actually became uh, almost physically sick. I saw the fear in my dad's eyes and that's when I knew that we might not land. This was 9-11 all over again. The passenger leapt across the seats and grabbed Abdul Mutala. He put him in a headlock and uh, dragged him forcibly out into the aisle. One flight crew member, she comes back with the fire extinguisher in her hand. I mean, she's running full speed. And then I hear the noises of a fire extinguisher. You think, okay, incident under control. So, a little, little bit of exhale. Abdul Muttalib was dragged into business class. The person they brought down was a, was a very young, sort of small stature black man, and he was wearing a long white t-shirt, and his pants were at his ankles. The passengers of Flight 253 had been incredibly lucky. Abdul Muttalib had failed to detonate his bomb. The chemical reaction caused a fire, but no explosion, leaving him with severe burns. Clearly, he should be screaming in pain, he should be writhing about, but he wasn't. He was just staring off into space and no expression, no emotion, no nothing. And uh, that time it hit me. I said, my God, this is the guy. I saw him at the airport. He's trying to blow up the plane. That bothers me right away. Why didn't I tell the security? And this a tall guy. He's the one telling him, sit down. And they throw him in the chair. Return to your seats and fasten your seatbelts. We are landing. Right are about landing. that minute, it felt like the pilot came on. And I, I'm sure he said more, but all I remember him saying was, we're landing, we're landing right now. At 11.53 a.m. on Christmas morning, Flight 253 touched down at Detroit Airport. I have never felt such a sense of relief in my whole life. It was the first time since the incident started that I had any notion that I would survive it. First thing I said, thank you, God. You heard my prayers. As soon as Flight 253 came to a halt, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib was removed from the plane. I had a pretty good look because they took him out the door right in front of me, and I just remember that he wasn't crying, he didn't look angry, he didn't look happy, you know, just a poker face, if you will. Northwest Flight 253 was held on the runway while U.S. authorities questioned failed suicide bomber Abdul Muttalib. He reportedly confessed he was trained by Al-Qaeda in Yemen and claimed there were hundreds more like him, primed to attack planes bound for the US. He later pleaded not guilty to attempted murder. Terrorists come back to aviation over and over again because it is such a dramatic target. Um, there is a sense of um, drama to the potential of bringing down this, uh, this grand symbol of modernity. Abdul Muttalib had defeated the full armory of airport security. His mission ended only when his bomb failed to explode. But what would have happened if the detonation had worked? Inside a disused Boeing 747, on a winter's day in Gloucestershire, an important experiment is taking place. Dr. John Wyatt, an international terrorism and explosives advisor to the UN, wants to find out exactly how much damage the explosive device would have caused to Flight 253 had it detonated properly. 
What we've not seen is this very small amount of explosive in this sort of circumstances. There is still that element of the unknown until you've actually done it. Dr. Wyatt will share the results of his test with governments and civil aviation authorities around the world to limit the damage from future terrorist attacks. He believes that Al-Qaeda hoped the explosion would rupture the plane's fuselage, igniting the fuel tanks and causing a catastrophic crash. For the test to be accurate, Wyatt must reconstruct as faithfully as possible conditions on board Flight 253. First, the team placed two sets of seating on the port side of the aircraft, exactly where row 19 would have been. Wyatt believes Al-Qaeda would have known this was close to the fuel tanks on the plane. Right, so we need to put this lad in, in his seat. Next, a crash test dummy was positioned in the same spot as Abdul Muttalib, seat 19A. A window seat gave the bomber's device the best chance of piercing the fuselage. The choice of seat is very important because you're trying to cut down the distance between the source of the explosion and actually the fuselage. Wyatt used the same amount of PETN that it is believed was used in the Christmas Day attack. So we have to take this on the outer side of the knee. It's likely the bomber would have positioned the charge for maximum impact. Okay. Now we need to shift the body towards the fuselage as if his knee was right up against it. Yep. Okay, so we... I think what yeah. Al-Qaeda are looking for here is that sharp punch. Small amounts of explosives close to can cause just as much damage in that first one or two meters. So it can be just as powerful as, as the largest bomb. Yep. Okay, so we probably need to move him a bit further forward. That's it. Right neck, that's excellent. At the time of the attempted detonation, Flight 253 was descending rapidly, and its altitude has been estimated to be around 10,000 feet. At that height, the difference in pressure inside and outside the plane would not have been great enough significantly to affect the explosion, so the decommissioned plane's lack of doors is not a factor. Next, Wyatt's team positioned pressure sensors at various distances from the PETN. It's a 500 psi sensor and we'll measure the uh, incident blast wave as it comes past the sensor. He wanted to discover how much damage the blast would create inside the cabin. So we need to accurately measure this to the actual device itself. That's right, yeah. And then with the three sensors, we can then draw a graph. And yep. we'll know, because we've got three points in the graph, we'll know the curve. Yep. So we can predict the pressure at any point. That, that, that's absolutely excellent. It'd be very useful information. Yeah. I'm expecting to see what would happen within the cabin environment, and therefore the types of injuries you're going to get, is whether it actually will push through or it will rebound off the fuselage back into the cabin. And that is really the unknown at this, at this stage. With the preparation complete, Wyatt retreated to a safe distance to watch the explosion on a monitor. To inspect the blast damage, Dr. Wyatt was joined by Captain J. Joseph, an experienced air accident investigator. Joseph can interpret the impact the bomb would have had on the plane's ability to fly. The results of the explosion surprised them both. On the exterior, the integrity of the plane held. Well, from a structure standpoint, everything looks like it remained uh, uh, relatively intact. Although the impact of the blast pushed the fuselage out, the flexibility of the 5 mm thick aluminium alloy skin allowed it to expand and not breach. 
there's quite a lot of give in this. And that's what's actually happened, is that the energy has been caused to cause the bulb, but then it's allowed the pressure to go back. If it was a more rigid material, then we might have seen a crack or a breakthrough, but this is actually quite a flexible material. I was extremely impressed by the aircraft structure. Um, it can sustain quite a hefty thump. You can see the rivet lines continue around, and they're uh, showing good continuity. It's just the focus point of the explosion itself where we did lose, uh, lose the rivets. We noticed the aircraft had lost some rivets, uh, but no flight controls were compromised, and certainly no fuel tanks were breached. I'm very confident that the, the flight crew uh, could have taken this airplane uh, without any incident at all and getting it on the ground safely. For security reasons, we cannot show details of the blast damage to the cabin interior in case it gives valuable information to terror groups. It would have been uh, quite horrific. Obviously, the blast itself, which would cause eardrum rupture, the noise, uh, the smoke, and not to mention the parts of, uh, of the bodies that were uh, disintegrated as part of the explosion. From analyzing the blast sensors, it's clear the bomber and the passenger next to him would die in the explosion. But Wyatt believes they'd be the only fatalities. The findings are reassuring. But when people realize that they're not seriously injured, it is surprisingly how quickly people can settle down under control. The experiment revealed that the amount of explosive Abdul Muttalab managed to smuggle on board Flight 253 was a fraction of what it would have taken to bring the plane down. I think it should be a confidence builder for uh, passengers. After seeing what we saw today, how well the aircraft uh, maintained its structural integrity, and obviously the pilot's capacity to fly the aircraft uh, should give them a great deal of confidence. Dr. Wyatt is confident that none of the footage shown of the test gives any critical information to terrorist organizations. Even though Abdul Muttalab's bomb would have failed to bring down Flight 253, the plot exposed a gaping hole in US intelligence systems that even embarrassed the president. When a suspected terrorist is able to board a plane with explosives on Christmas Day, the system has failed in a potentially disastrous way. And it's my responsibility to find out why and to correct that failure so that we can prevent such attacks in the future. This year, President Obama ordered changes to the way intelligence agencies analyze information. Unfortunately, there's been too much emphasis on hoovering up information. The question mark remains over what happens to the information once it enters those big computers in the United States. This included improving database integration and new ways to ensure terrorist watch lists are updated with more zeal and regularity. I think there needs to be a reflection about how information is analyzed automatically, whether or not we have the right databases and systems, especially with technological advances, to be able to put disparate pieces of information together. But Abdul Muttalab also defeated security screening at three international airports, proving that Al-Qaeda had found a way to breach the existing systems. The lesson here is that we have to make it more difficult for these people to bring components aboard the aircraft. The problem we have is that the technology we have in place at the screening checkpoints do not enable the screeners to find what it is they're looking for. But the next generation of airport security technology could solve that problem. Body scanners, which generate an image of a passenger naked, are already available. But the scanners have been criticized for contravening privacy laws. If we respond to the privacy folks and we start blurring out parts of the body, uh, then we definitely are not going to find what we're looking for. Regardless of privacy concerns, Gordon Brown has erred on the side of caution at all UK airports. People will see uh, gradually being brought in the use of full body scanners. They now operate at Heathrow, Manchester and Birmingham, and President Obama has ordered 150 body scanners for US airports. But the Christmas Day bomb plot 
has cast doubt over whether scanners are able to detect the most carefully concealed package. What happens if you uh, put those same items within a body cavity? Then you open a whole new series of problems. Nothing's 100%. I think body scanning should be one of the tools that we use in aviation security until something better comes along. There's a growing belief that simply relying on yet more technology is not the answer. I don't know of one case in aviation security where an X-ray machine or a metal detector or any other form of technology caught a terrorist with a bomb. Nothing in security is foolproof, nothing. But I can tell you that with profiling, with a human-based system, you get as close to perfect as you can. Brandis worked in security at Israeli airline El Al. They pioneered a new layer of security designed to identify potential terrorist threats. It's called behavioral profiling. That the concept of looking for indicators in someone's behavior, story, uh, identity, overall appearance. The issue for us is not so much to look for the means of the attack, but rather look for the intent. Instead of relying solely on questioning at security checkpoints, specially trained operatives patrol airports on the lookout for suspicious behavior. You have to have people on the ground who, as they see suspicion, go after it, question it, deal with it. For instance, a passenger with too little luggage with them. Uh, that could indicate a passenger who is uh, not really planning on landing. <laughs> Since El Al introduced profiling over 20 years ago, they haven't had a single terrorist incident. It's something that can be adopted throughout the world. It just means changing the way we work, not buying more stuff. Behavioral profiling is already in operation in 150 U.S. airports and is now being trialed at Heathrow. The Christmas Day bomb plot was a lucky escape, and the incident has left many questioning whether flying is still the safest mode of travel. Many times asked, is it safe to fly? And of course it is. It sounds trite, but the most dangerous trip is the drive to the airport. It's not the flight itself. We are safe to fly. The likelihood of getting on a plane tomorrow and being caught up in an instance such as happened on Christmas Day is remote. If we get ourselves backed into a position where we were living within a culture of fear, then of course the terrorists have won by doing absolutely nothing. Tomorrow I'm going to take the same flight, Northwest 253 from Amsterdam to Detroit. And I want to tell them, look, I'm taking the same flight again. I'm not scared. We have to be all feel strong. They are trying to scare us. We are not going to be scared. <laughs> 